This past weekend marked the closure of 285 Kent, an independently managed and independently booked uh, concert venue in Brooklyn. Um, it's right about three doors down from where five of my best friends from college lived from 1997 to about 2001. Uh, in a loft where they had to, it was a converted warehouse space and they had to build their own, um, you know, bunk beds and stuff like that. ELPs to hang out there quite a bit, actually. Now everything's different. And I wanted to make a video about this, not because I think it's important, not because I think it's unimportant, but because a number of people have selectively interpreted things that I've said on Twitter and elsewhere about how little or much this matters um, and just decided, you know, I'm saying what they have an answer for and so, you know, they can just file me away. Well, there's a number of things that you don't have an answer for because there's a number of things that you're not thinking clearly about. Todd P is probably the most important person in the underground music scene in New York over the last 10 years, more. He, he's somebody that is absolutely unimpeachable. And, and so is Rick and so is the staff at 285. It's not about these people. The vast majority of shows that 285 Kent has put on over its you know, last two years of existence have been uncommercial to the point of absurdity, to the point where like there's 10 people there. Um, and, and that's the real history and importance of this venue to me, is that this venue made daring choices and book just as many of the types of bands that you're likely to see at, like Silent Barn and Bushwick, um, you know, in a, a relatively good-sized space. When you're talking about, you know, obscure European artists and and you know, like outsider folk and whatever, the, this is stuff that not that many people are even interested in to begin with. So in that sense, it's a really big space relative to the audience that's likely to be drawn by a lot of these acts. So clearly, Todd and Rick's motivation is not money; it's art. And it's trying to create a good scene and a good social network around these bands and give people an opportunity to hear music that they're not going to hear at, you know, Webster Hall or any of these other, you know, mid-tier or larger venues in Manhattan. And, and it means that it's also not like Glasslands where, you know, you can fit maybe, you know, 50 people in front of the stage and then everyone else is upstairs, you know, doing coke or whatever. Um, no, they're not. But the way it was run was extremely, definitively DIY. And that's all great. What happened over the last two years, year and a half really, is that they decided to let larger brands in. Think about this though. If Rolling Stone presented a show at 285 Kent with Speedy Ortiz and all of these great upcoming bands that are brand new and only have one album out and very few people have heard of them and they're so exciting and they represent a new young voice, etc., etc., if the flyer for that show said, brought to you by Rolling Stone and Top Man and Doc Martens, would you go to that show? I really doubt it, because you think Rolling Stone sucks. You think it's completely uncool, and for people even older than me. Here's the reality. Pitchfork is a multi-million dollar advertising portal. It uses music to sustain a massive multi-million dollar ad sales network. Without that, Pitchfork doesn't exist because Pitchfork doesn't do anything that has any value. What they are is, is the agreed upon, you know, landing spot for young kids and people who are interested in obscure or newer music. But the only way they've sustained that is by selling ads from Lexus, American Apparel, Miller Coors, Absolute Vodka, Top Man, I mean Converse, it just goes on and on. Converse is part of Nike, by the way. So my issue with this is when you start throwing around words like DIY and punk and hardcore and the show's being sponsored by Rolling Stone, Pitchfork is a bigger brand than Rolling Stone right now, in the digital space, at least. There is absolutely no question about that. If you can't see that, because you're all buddies and you all live and Pitchfork is now based in Greenpoint, you're so deluded, it's just untrue. And what really upsets me is, there's like 500, 1,000 of you, 1,500 of you, maybe. There's a whole world out there. Pitchfork claims they have almost 5 million readers a month. And they're selling them 
ads for Lexus and American Apparel and Miller Coors so that they can go party at 285 Kent with their 300 besties and <laughs> do a documentary about it. The day after it closes, they're going to put up a fucking documentary film shot on cameras that cost like $20,000. And they're literally shooting it the day before the place closes, or the day before their series of shows when it's closing. <laughs> this is the real issue, okay? All, all you guys who are hanging out and having fun and palling around and convincing yourselves that what you're doing is this like real, legitimate, incredible DIY scene, none of that's going to be happening without the ad money that Pitchfork gets. Because that's who's paying the PR companies and that's who's paying the guarantee for the bands to even come and play the show. A guarantee of money. They're paying the bands money to play a fucking DIY show. Money that comes from Lexus. You guys are so fucked in the head. You have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. You know what you think 285 Kent is? You think 285 Kent is the mask. You think 285 Kent is a bombed out, underground, fucking cigarette stained place where the Dickies and the nuns are going to play, and Belinda Carlisle was there when she was 16, and people are walking around half naked, spray painting the walls, drinking and smoking. They did do that, and so did you, but they did it themselves. You wouldn't have even gone outside if it hadn't all been paid for by these advertising companies. You guys just don't get it. And you don't get how it looks when you put up this huge, you know, funereal, melodramatic, oral histories everywhere. The New Yorker goes out. David Shapiro writes this completely sanguine, just pathetic piece. I don't even know if he's been there. And, and the New York Times? John, seriously? This is like your third piece about fucking 285 Kent? The New York Times probably has more important things in terms of the size of its readership that they should be talking about. Even if you just limit it to independent music, there's still way more important things to be talking about. Because when you do this, when you all get together and you all keep hammering on how awesome what you're doing right now is and how much fun it is and how it's the only legitimate, credible thing going and it is a definition of cool, there's only about 500 people who are blessed to be part of that. Do you know what that's called? It's called elitism. The rest of your 5 million readers feel like shit when you do that. And what do all these other local scenes do? You know, one of the reasons I quit Pitchfork and nobody really understands this is because I had argued with Ryan about creating a bureau in New York back when the site was in Chicago. I wanted me, Andy Beta, and a couple of other people to open a bureau and sponsor shows and get out there and try and network and make this shit happen. And yeah, work for a living. Because I wasn't comfortable with the ad thing, but that wasn't a factor when I was there. Because Chris Caskey hadn't come over from The Onion yet. Um, you know, I wanted to start bureaus in all these cities. Because if you're not there and participating and you don't know the people, shut the fuck up. Pitchfork was completely paranoid about New York City and Brooklyn when it was still in Chicago. It hated everything going on out here. It treated the Strokes like, you know, Def Leppard. They weren't. They were at Union Pool. I saw them a bunch of times. They were pretty approachable guys. You know, and I mean, it's just like, nobody gets this. What's going on is that because New York is the media center of the world, and now Pitchfork is there, everybody is right together, and it's so easy, and they're taking the easiest, laziest route to conduct business and make money. You don't even see it. You're treating music like you have control over it. And, and you're using the influence and the power that you have through selling ads um, to, to control what people have access to. That's, that was the whole complaint we had in the first fucking place. Is that nobody was doing right by music or by kids or by young new bands. Everything's different now. Because if they don't keep inventing bands that they own and inventing bands that they can say that they, you know, brought to you, then they're not credible and they're not cool. The whole thing falls apart real fucking quick. Because that's what they're based on. They're never going to get a fucking scoop on Kanye or Beyonce. They're going to just be part of the general celebrity reportage. Because those are celebrities. You can't scoop that. What you can do is make up new stuff and say, this is good, you should check this out. 
that that's great. The only stuff that you're saying is good is the stuff that's right outside your front fucking door. Or is represented by the PR companies that you're cozy with and you go out and fucking party with all the time. You're not doing the work that you're in a position to do. If you spent the money differently, if you distributed it more, I could see it. You know? But I really don't think the, the Paris Festival, which is fucking populated by the same fucking clutch of bands that you have invented and said are happening, is helping. You know, they tried to put more, you know, local French and European acts on that, but it's not even close. Look how hard something like Rookie tries to continue to do outreach, to continue to publish really difficult, challenging, in some places just like uncomfortable material. You know, because they can't control who reads it, right? Now, I'm 38, and if I'm reading something from a 17-year-old girl about, like, losing your virginity, that's a little bit weird. I mean, I have a 7-year-old daughter, but that's what they want to do. That's their mission statement, and they're sticking to their guns on that. And they're doing, you know, speaking engagements. They're everywhere. Eight years ago, when somebody would be, like, crazy mad about Pitchfork and ranting and raving, you'd be like, uh, you're fucking nuts. Because Pitchfork didn't make any money, and they didn't sell barely any ads, and they were nothing. But once Chris Caskey came in, woo, that shit got up and running real quick. Now they make, you know, now they make millions of dollars. Literally. So... You know, what, what are they doing with that? They're putting on festivals. They're doing things that allow them to continue to make money. They're really not, you know, giving anything back. Do the musicians make any of that ad money? Nope. They don't make any money. That's why all the bands break up, because they don't make any fucking money. It's exhausting to put so much into this and get nothing for it. They make shit. Ryan Schreiber's condo costs $722,000. It's in the Rialto. That transaction is part of the public record of home sales in New York. $722,000. And you want to talk to me about DIY. This is just absolutely fucking absurd, old media mentality, greed, selfishness, laziness, you know, protectionist thinking for, you know, for selling ads. They don't do anything. They sell ads, they negotiate PR campaigns, they help distribute influence. That's it. They're just a, they're a fucking pusher. That's all they are. They're just pushing PR campaigns, they're pushing favors, and it's just fucking gotten to the point where people are going to get pissed. The last time there was this kind of stranglehold where critics and overeducated liberal arts kids and rich kids and predominantly white kids had control over what pop music was and what was cool and what was getting talked about and written about... Go back to England in the early 80s after punk was over. The type of behavior and the type of music that they were celebrating was confrontational, academic, and, you know, often kind of fey and, you know, really pushing the edge in terms of, darling, it's all art, it's all money, it's all pop, darling, it's beautiful. Because it was new for them to be in a position to have that kind of leverage, and so they enjoyed it. The problem is they enjoyed it too much. And what happened was a reaction in the working class. Oi. It's one of the stupidest forms of music that's ever existed. Um, it's Half of it's borderline racist. But this is the kind of stuff that happens when you start behaving in such an elitist, closed-minded way. When you are so totally fucking blind to how the rest of the world sees what you're doing and what you're celebrating. When the perspective is forced on you by the masses, that's a bad time. And if you want to prevent that from happening, you can't keep patting yourself on the back for thinking that discovering a new obscure band is about the band. It's not. It's about you as a publication, as a brand. And eventually, people are going to get really tired of what happens to them as artists when they get, you know, your stamp put on them. Then they get nothing for it and they break up six months later. And meanwhile, while they were a running news item on your site, you sold about $150,000 of ads. When you have an information regime, when you have way too much control over way too many people, and you're telling them it's this way, it's this way, all these other people that aren't benefiting from that, that are being kept out of participating in that, that are by that exclusion being told they're not cool, they're not good enough, they don't matter. Eventually there's going to be enough of them that they're going to 
tell you to go fuck yourself. I'll just be first. I usually am. I can't think of anybody that I could point to and say that their monetary success was A, substantial, and B, entirely down to having, you know, been broken by this current pattern. But there's like a dozen people I can point to who have made millions of dollars in ad sales in making sure that doesn't happen and keeping you down and keeping you where they control what you do, how much you make, what shows you play, and when your career's over, when they give you a 5.0.